Well, tonight, I want to invite you, no matter where you are, to open your Bible or look on your smartphone or however you follow along in the scriptures at Mark chapter 4. I've got a message that I want to share this weekend uh, entitled, Unwavering Faith, Unwavering Faith. And I want to draw your attention to verse number 35 of Mark chapter 4, and it starts like this. It says, on that day... When evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him, and they said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Peace, and be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear, and they said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Unwavering faith. You know, this weekend I had planned on continuing our series entitled Building a Radiant City. It's our vision series that is part of our strategic vision initiative to expand. And, uh, and we've been working through the book of Nehemiah looking at principles of that. And so I had planned on continuing in that vein this weekend. And then this week happened. And so what I've decided to do is push that series off until things kind of normalize again. But in the midst of it, this week when everything changed, when the stock market took a historic drop a couple different times, when the spread obviously of coronavirus uh, across the United States and now into our own state of Michigan became headline news and then the, the governor of our state uh, requested that large gatherings be kept to a minimum it kind of changed everything, and not just for us. Obviously, it's changed everything for churches all over the country. We are living in unprecedented times, and this is a, a, really, in our own lifetime, this is an unprecedented moment. We've never experienced anything like this before. And in the midst of it, whenever you find yourself in unprecedented moments or uncharted waters, you have to stop sometimes, and you have to ask the question, maybe God hasn't caused this, but somehow, what is God saying in the midst of it? And that's kind of what I did. I went to the Lord. I just said, obviously, everything's changed. How do you want us to approach this weekend? What kind of message do you want me to bring? Are we going to do it online? Are we going to gather? And then when we realized that we weren't going to be able to gather, okay, Lord, what do you want me to say to our people? This is the passage that the Holy Spirit immediately took me to. Because in a way, what we are experiencing is very similar to what the disciples experienced in this moment. They find themselves in the midst of a storm that they had not planned on, and that's exactly where our nation has found itself. It's where we as a church and a community, and even in our city of Kalamazoo and our region of Southwest Michigan, we found ourselves in this very same place. And my hope tonight is that this message will help calibrate all of us to be people of unwavering faith unwavering faith in the midst of the storm. See, because just like in this story, storms come suddenly. You don't plan on a storm on the Sea of Galilee because it's surrounded by mountains. The winds will come from the southwest direction and they will sweep across down into the bowl of the Sea of Galilee and create massive waves and a massive storm. Most of the time it's in the afternoon, but in this particular situation it happened in the evening when it's darkest, when it's difficult to navigate. And it created and it stirred in the disciples' hearts a sudden panic. They found themselves in the storm trying to figure out how to navigate their way to the other side. After all, that's what Jesus had said was the mission and was the goal. We're going to the other side. But now they find themselves suddenly in a storm. That's the thing about storms. Storms come up suddenly and they pass quickly. And what remains after a storm 
is very simple. What remains after the storm is what we learn from the middle of the storm. That's the only thing that remains on the other side, is what we learn in the middle of the storm. The disciples would be forever changed and transformed when they finally did get to the other side. The storm was gone, the water calmed. Jesus said, peace be still to the winds and the waves, and they obeyed him, but yet they would never be the same. And that's what we need to take a look at when we go through storms in life. Storms don't always look like boat rides and waves. They don't always look the same, but storms have a lot of the same characteristics. Doesn't matter what kind of storm you're going through. It can be an economic storm. It can be a your job is on the line storm. It could be a fear or a, a, a true health crisis as a storm. A storm is not so much about what goes on around us. Oftentimes, the greatest storms that we face are the ones within us. When we're faced with contrary winds, when things shift around us, when the economy drops 2,000 points, when the news constantly is talking about the fear and the threat and what seems to be overwhelming odds, all of a sudden we begin to experience storms, not just on the outside, but storms on the inside of us. And storms are very good at revealing things. See, storms reveal a lot of things. They reveal a lot of things about ourselves. Oftentimes when storms hit, what we find is that they whip up the waves in places of our lives where most of the time we feel in control. Think about these disciples. Jesus had just finished up a you know, a ministry campaign, and he's tired, and he tells his disciples there's multiple boats, probably more than just the 12, but Jesus gets into the boat with his 12, and these are experienced mariners. They're experienced fishermen. They know boats. They know the Sea of Galilee. They know the winds. It's like second nature to them. This is where they've grown up in their whole life. This is the land of familiar and the, the, the comfort zone, if you will. But in a moment, when a storm hit, what had been familiar to them, when the winds came and began to change the composition of the comfort zone, the comfort zone is turned into a panic room and a battle zone. Because now the battle is on. They can't see. The water is coming up over the deck. It's beginning to fill up. They don't have any light to recognize where they're going, and yet Jesus is asleep in the bottom of the boat. And what the storm reveals in the disciples in this moment is their fears and their doubts. You see, when Jesus told them, let's go to the other side, what they didn't realize is before they could ever get to the other side, which is the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, where they would have their greatest ministry, they would see the, the greatest results, demoniacs set free, healings, miracles take place. Before they could get to the other side, Jesus had to deal with their other side. See, because there's, a there's two sides to us as followers of Jesus that are constantly in this tension. The one side of us is the part of us that loves Jesus, believes God, loves his word. We know that his presence is with us. We sing songs about the presence of God being with us. We love church. We love his word. We read it. Our faith rises up on the inside of us. There's that side of us, but there's another side. And that other side of us is only revealed in the storm. It's the side of us where fear rises up because of the waves. It's the other side of us where our doubts rise up because Jesus doesn't seem to care. That's what the disciples said to Jesus. They said, do you not care that we're perishing? And their fears, what, how did their fears manifest? It says that the waves were breaking in and what was it doing? It was threatening them and their security. This is the other side of them that Jesus was dealing with. When Jesus said, let's go to the other side, his primary meaning was we're gonna get to the other side of the lake, but they didn't realize spiritually we're also gonna pay a visit to your other side. 
Because if we can deal with the other side where faith and doubt wants to reside, if we can uproot that, then what can be replaced by it is a stronger, more unwavering faith, the kind of faith that's gonna be necessary to cast demons out of the demoniac when we get to the other side, the kind of faith that's gonna be necessary to face trials in the midst of persecution, the kind of faith that's gonna be able to believe God in the middle of some very difficult situations. We gotta deal with that other side. Think about what James says in James chapter one. It says the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. That sound familiar? For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. The reason why Jesus needs to deal in all of us with our other side is because it creates instability spiritually in us. It's not God being mean saying, oh, because you believed a lie, then you're not gonna get anything from me. That's not at all the tone of the scripture. What James is writing is really the same thing Jesus is trying to get to. It's that when the waves, when the winds come, when the storm comes, it reveals all kinds of things about us. It reveals to us our fears. It reveals our doubts. It reveals the lies that we choose to believe that God doesn't care. You see, there's a a lie that manifests, and it manifests through fears and doubt. But yet, at the same time, that our fears and our doubt are manifesting. I I want you to recognize this, that at their feet was Jesus, who is the truth, who is resting in God. And he's not shaken, and he's not awakened. See, storms don't shake Jesus, and storms don't wake Jesus. Storms just unveil Jesus. It just unveils the rest of God as he's laying there and he's at rest in the midst of the storm. What is that a picture of? It's a picture of the truth of God in the midst of lies that we're tempted to grab a hold of and say, God doesn't care. Where is God in the midst of this? Where is God in the midst of a national crisis? Doesn't he care? And we, we watch the news every hour as we see more waves crashing in, more waves and and what seems to be the destruction as the ship of our society begins to fill up. But even when that all happens, we need to get our eyes off of the waves. We need to get our eyes off of the filling vessel that we find ourselves in and be reminded that God is at rest in the midst of the storm and he is with us in the boat. He's not abandoned us out of the boat. He's not bailed out of the boat. He didn't walk to the other side. He's in the boat with us. And he's the one who's able to still the storms and calm the waves. And more than that, he's able to calm our hearts. He's able to speak peace to us. He said, let us go to the other side. There's a story about John Wesley and Charles Wesley that I think is appropriate for this story. Everybody knows John and Charles Wesley as some of the most prolific revivalists and reformers of their day. I mean, John Wesley preached thousands and thousands of sermons. He was a leading voice in the first great awakening in both the United States as well as in England. He began the Methodist movement that was really an outgrowth of the revival that took place. He preached to crowds of 30,000 people in open fields, saw miracles, salvations, healings. I mean, it's extraordinary. He wrote, uh, he wrote over 500 pamphlets and books on horseback while a certain circuit-riding preacher. His brother Charles was a prolific hymn writer. But in 1735, as two young Anglican ministers, they had committed to travel by ship to the penal colony of Georgia in order to convert the heathen. And while they were traveling in 1735 on this ship, they encountered a massive storm, a kind of storm that was sinking this ship that had hundreds of people on it, probably a hurricane or a tropical storm. They didn't have Doppler radar at that time. They didn't have the means to really define what it was. All he knew is he thought he was gonna die. And in the middle of this storm, he noticed everyone on the ship 
was filled with fear and there were cries and groanings of anxiety. He himself was scared. He thought he literally was going to die. And he noticed there was a group of people on the ship that were speaking German and not English. And instead of crying, they were praying. And instead of weeping, they were singing hymns and praise to God. They were a group of people called the Moravians. And the Moravians in the midst of the storm were able to praise God, sing hymns, and trust God with their lives in the midst of the storm. John Wesley went up to one of the leaders at the end of the storm, and he said, I noticed that everybody else on the ship, including myself, was fearing for, fearing for our very lives. And he asked them this question, were you not afraid? Were your children not afraid? And the answer that he got back was, we were not afraid, not afraid for our lives because we know whose hands our lives are in. Do you know that that encounter changed John Wesley's life? About three years later, when he returned to England, he found where the Moravians were meeting and he went to one of the meetings and it was there that this ordained intellectual Anglican cleric finally submitted his life to Jesus Christ and was actually born again and saved and became one of the greatest voices that God raised up in England during the Great Awakening. You see, God had to deal with his other side in the middle of the storm. But when he finally got him to the other side, when he got him to the shores of both America and then when he got him to England, something had changed on the inside of him he had resolved the issue. He was no longer double-minded. He knew who he believed in. He knew the power of God. He knew the answer to the question of who is this? Because he had encountered the presence of Jesus and the rest of God in the midst of the storm. See, the disciples asked this question. Jesus stands up when they wake him up. They rouse him. They say, Jesus, we're perishing. Don't you care? It was only his disciples screaming in his ear. That actually woke him up. I mean, that's deep sleep. Jesus, whoa, whoa. He stands up and he's like, don't you care? He begins to realize the waves are coming in, the winds are blowing the storms, and what, is, what does Jesus do? Does he join in the panic? Does he say, well, I wasn't planning on this, I'm too tired, you know, I've had a busy day of ministry? No, it says that he, he stood up and he said, peace! Be still. And what was described by Mark as a great windstorm then is described by Mark after Jesus says that as a great calm. God has the ability to take great storms and turn them into great calm. See, I believe whether it's the storm that we're in or a storm that we don't know about or a storm that you're just coming out of or a storm that nobody knows about, a storm that's going on on the inside, we don't need a virus outbreak and we don't need an economic turn in our lives to find ourselves in the boat in the middle of a storm. It doesn't matter what it is that we find ourselves in the middle of. What matters is that the rest of God, the Jesus that's in our boat, is able to take a great storm that you find yourself in and turn it into a great calm. He's able to do that. And it begs the question, it's the question that the disciples asked, who is this? Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The sea and the waves, the things that are uncontrollable and unpredictable. Who is this? that controls the very forces of nature. After all, that's what wind, that's what waves, that's what storms are. They're uncontrollable. Have you ever tried to control the wind? Good luck with that. You can harness the wind, but you can't control the wind. You can't tell the wind when to stop, and you can't tell the wind when to begin. You, you can't stop the effects of the wind in nature, on the oceans, in the places of your familiarity. Listen to me, Christian. You can't control when the storms of your life begin and when they end, but what you can control is the posture of heart, and you can believe in the truth more than you believe in the lie, and you can choose to embrace the rest of God instead of embracing the doubt that wants to work its way into your boat. 
He is the one. You want another answer to the question of who this is? He is the one that even the wind and the seas obey him. The uncontrollable, the unpredictable forces of our life. He is stronger than them. He took a great storm and he turned it into a great calm. The issue, listen, the issue is not whether the sea and the wind will obey him. The real issue is, will we? Will we obey him? <laughs> listen, for God, it's a lot easier to control the hurricanes and the storms and the natural effects than it is to control the human heart. God could do that. He's powerful. He's strong enough to do that, but he chooses not to do it. You and I are called to harness that storm. Let him speak to the external forces, but you and I have got to speak to the internal forces of our own heart. We've got to remind our heart, I believe that he is able. I believe that his goodness goes before me. I embrace his peace. I'm leaning into the storm. If you've ever seen a weatherman when they're standing out in a hurricane, like on the eastern seaboard, and they're reporting, they've got their microphone and their little L.L. Bean windbreaker on, and they got the cameraman there with water squirting up onto the lens, and well, we got a category four. They're like leaning into the camera like this because the wind is blowing them back. If they didn't lean into it, they'd be blown away, and so they're holding on. It's like Willard Scott holding onto a palm tree, trying to report, and his face is getting pulled back, and his eye sockets are being peeled wide open because of the force of the wind. And what does he do? He leans into it. When we find ourselves in the wind, we find ourselves in an internal storm of reacting to what's going on around us. What's the answer? It's lean in. It's not lean back. It's lean in. It's to become, par to become mobilized in that moment and not become paralyzed by fear. It's the greatest question that we need to ask our heart is, Yes, I know that the wind and the sea obey him, but am I gonna obey him? Am I gonna believe him? Am I going to be paralyzed by what I'm going through right now? Am I gonna be paralyzed by the fear? Am I gonna hunker down and become very self-centered and self-preservationist? Am, am I gonna let my imagination become a video screen that I let the enemy show the latest predictions and demise that he has for me and for my future? Am I gonna allow myself to be paralyzed in this moment, no matter what the storm is? Am I gonna let the lies be the credits that run on the screen of my imagination, keeping me up at night, anxiety-ridden, tense, stressed out? Am I, am I gonna hunker down and Live like it's 1999, about ready to turn into Y2K. Am I gonna go back to that level of fear that everybody had at Y2K? Is that how I'm gonna live? Or am I gonna be mobilized by faith? Church, I just wanna make it clear that when we're specifically talking about the storm of what's going on in America, I wanna remind everybody, this storm will pass. This storm will pass, but what is it gonna reveal about us on the other side? What's it gonna reveal about us? This storm is gonna come to an end. Churches are gonna go back to normal or a new normal, and we're gonna gather again in buildings. The fear of the coronavirus will be logged away, and I'm not diminishing the significance of it. I, I believe that we need to be wise and we need to be discerning. We need to, be, we need to wash our hands. We need to stock up on, if you can, on wipes or whatever. I, there's things in the natural that we need to do, and those things are not fear. Those things are not being motivated by fear. That's being motivated by wisdom. There's nothing wrong with keeping a little distance between yourself and give somebody a little foot tap or a little elbow or maybe a little fist bump or a nice wave at somebody. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not a lack of faith to not shake somebody's hands and greet them with a holy kiss and smother them with yourself at every given moment. That's not a lack of faith. But I'm just telling you, this storm will pass. And when we get to the other side, and I'm talking about the church, big C, when we get to the other side, I don't want to look back on how we went through the storm and see that we were paralyzed 
immobilized, polarized. I want to see that in the midst of the storm, we let Jesus deal with the other side of us and begin to recalibrate some things and reset us for revival. Reset us for, I think that this can become an opportunity in which Jesus resets the church around the principles and the values and the priorities that maybe at times have become a comfort zone for us and we become a little laid back, leaning back instead of leaning in. What do I mean by resetting for revival? Well, I'm talking about worship. Are we gonna lean in or are we gonna bail out? Well, we can't come into the building anymore, so um, you know I'm just not gonna go to church. No, what's the means that we have? How persistent are you in your worship? I'm gonna put it on my TV in my living room and I'm gonna bring my kids in and instead of us binging out to the Disney Channel together, this is an opportunity for us to reset worship in our home. We're gonna worship, we're gonna get up at 8 a.m. and we're gonna pray. I've never been to a prayer meeting before, but baby, we're gonna pray now. You see, we can reset, we can lean in. You can worship in your car. Instead of listening to bad news, constantly negative news, CNN, instead of listening to that in your car, reminding you about how bad things are, maybe you listen to that for five minutes and then you put the new Jeremy Riddle album on and you begin to worship God on holy ground. I'm talking about giving. Well, you know, we're not coming to church and so we're not necessarily required to give. Listen, the enemy wants to paralyze the church in America. God wants to unhinder the church in America. He wants to release when, when in the natural our tendency is to hold on to everything. Well, you know, my, my 401k took a nosedive and my stocks and my retirement took a nosedive and, you know, everything, 2,000 points. You know, somebody said to me, a young person said to me this week, they're just like, I'm so concerned about the stock market. And I said to them, don't worry about it. You didn't have any money invested in it anyways. You're as poor as you were on day one. <laughs> but you know what? We can be paralyzed by the trends, the highs and the lows, or we can lean into it and say, you know what? This is a perfect opportunity for me to establish that I'm gonna be a tither in the house of God. I'm gonna find a way. I may have gotten off track, but I'm about to start again. And you know what, devil? You thought you're gonna, mo uh, you're gonna immobilize me in fear about giving? I'm doubling down. I'm gonna give to missions. I'm gonna find people in my community that I can give to. I'm gonna go buy some groceries for some elderly people. I'm gonna get online. I'm gonna find where it says give online, and I'm gonna... For the first time, I'm gonna set up my recurring giving. I'm gonna give because I'm gonna reset for revival. Family, are we gonna mourn the loss of school being canceled and business and distractions and all of those things that we give our time to being removed? Or are we gonna rejoice in the new time that God has given to us as a family? We got our kids home. We don't know for how long. You know what? Double down. And I understand that there's some parents who are right now trying to wrestle with, you know, child care and work and those kinds of things. But at the same time, we have this massive opportunity to be together more than we ever have before. And listen, all the things that are natural, entertainment and sports and business and commerce and education and money and comfort have all been removed in this moment. What are we going to do with that? It's an opportunity for revival to begin in families. Serving others and protecting others instead of just protecting ourselves. Social distance does not mean ministry distance. And praying for our community. You see, right now is an opportunity for us to allow what's really always been in us to be revealed, which is Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Do you know that there is a great intercessor that lives on the inside of you? His name is the Holy Spirit, and he intercedes on your behalf with groanings that cannot be uttered, praying for you according to the will of God. Do you know that Jesus is the great intercessor seated at the right hand of the Father, constantly praying for you? Do you know that you were called to be an intercessor? Your prayers matter. God hears your prayers. This is not a time to back down. This is a time to lean in and to be a praying people. Holy Spirit is not intimidated at all by what's going on in this world. And I'll tell you what, there's a spirit of fear that wants to grip a hold of this entire generation. 
And this can be an opportunity where when people are looking for hope, people are looking for healing, people are looking for answers, people are looking for help, for the church to have its finest hour, to arise and to shine and to do it a little bit differently than we've normally done it. But listen, we gotta be trailblazers. We can't have the mentality of, Jesus, I've traveled across this sea so many times and I've never seen a storm and so this has gotta be the end. I just wanna remind you that his intentions are still to take you to the other side. And when we get to the other side, when we get to the other side of this moment and when we get to the other side of ourselves, I promise you that there is greater ministry, greater breakthrough, greater healing than we've ever experienced before. We are never going back to the other side the same way that we left the shore. It says in Mark chapter five, they came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gerasenes. Notice that they made it. They made it. But when they made it, they had seen another side of Jesus that they were unaware of before. A sustaining Jesus. A resting Jesus. A peace-filled Jesus a storm-stopping Jesus, a wind-stopping Jesus, an unwavering Jesus that stirred unwavering faith in them. I wanna ask you a question when we get to the other side of whatever battle you are facing tonight. When you get to the other side of this moment, be it an hour, a week, a month, when we as a nation, when we as the church get to the other side of this moment, are we gonna have a greater picture of Jesus than we had before we came into this? Are we gonna have unwavering faith? Is our double-minded gonna become singular focus? Have the doubts been buried? Have the fears been forgotten? Has our faith been elevated? Because if it has, when we get to the other side, just like Jesus said we would. Listen, he promised he'll never leave you and he will never forsake you in the midst of this. Are we gonna become a mobilized people? Are we gonna become a revived people? Or are we just going to, well, that, that's good that that's over. I'm glad that that's done. Let's go back to our regularly scheduled programming. Listen, we need to bury the old and we need to get ready for Jesus to resurrect the new because this is our finest hour. And I just wanna pray over every single one of Radiant Church. Listen, I know that you're in your homes. I know that some of you are maybe in Starbucks or you're gathered together at a watch party. And we're all gathered across different states, some of us in different communities, but we're also all facing a different perspective of what's going on. We've all got our own storms. Some of you are joining. You haven't been to church in years but this is shaking you up and maybe somebody sent you a link and said, hey, join me for church. Or maybe you've been going to church and you've been going through the motions of church, but you've, you've kind of been on autopilot and over the last couple of days, some, some despair has crept into your heart, something enough that's created a desperation to say, you know what, I'm gonna go and pursue. I need some hope. I need some help right now. I want you to know that God's favor in every situation, God's favor is towards you. God's favor is towards you, and he's with you. He's in the boat with you. He's resting, but he's with you. He's in the boat, and he is able to say peace to the storm, the waves to calm, and to reveal a side of who God is that maybe before this storm you never knew. And I wanna pray that right now, God, by his Holy Spirit, would begin to stir unwavering faith in every single one of us. Wherever you're at, at home, or in a living room someplace, I want you to do, do something, a physical act of response. I want you to stand to your feet. Wherever you're watching me, whatever uh, environment you find yourself in, I just want you to stand up, just like Jesus stood up in the boat. I want you to stand up and I want you to right now just close your eyes. Lord, I'm grateful for the power of technology that connects us. I'm even more grateful, Lord, for the technology of the Holy Spirit 
that unites us in one spirit, one body beyond walls. There is no separation in the spirit between any of us gathered and you. You are here. Lord, we believe the words that we often sing that even when we can't see it, you're working. Even when we can't feel it, you're moving. You're always at work. And Lord, today, it doesn't matter the situation. I just, I pray right now for those who work in the medical profession, doctors, nurses, caretakers, who right now are, are feeling the burden and the stress. Lord, I just pray right now for every single person who works in the medical profession, the caretaking profession, that the peace of God right now would calm the storm over them. Lord, you've appointed them for this hour to be salt, to be light, to be a word of encouragement, to be a smile, to be hope, to be healers. Lord, I pray for the burdens to be lifted off, the yoke to be removed, and for the grace and the favor of God and the anointing of God to rest in them for this moment. Lord, I pray for single moms and parents who right now are trying to figure out they're stressed about what to do with their kids. They're stressed about the finances. They're stressed about how this whole thing is gonna shake out. And right now, in the name of Jesus, we just say peace to the storm. Peace over our household. Peace over our finances. God, you're the way maker. We know that you don't get shaken or awakened in the storm but you hear us when we call on your name and you're roused to bring peace in the midst of the storm. Lord, I pray for those who are watching who are far away from you. Maybe they've never had a moment in their life where they've said, I believe Jesus is the Son of God and I need forgiveness, I need a savior. I've made so many mistakes, I've lived for myself and it's all come to an end and I need the grace of God. I wanna know that I'm right with God. I want the peace that surpasses all understanding to fill my heart. I wanna know that I have eternal life, that I'm forgiven in the sight of God. And if you're watching and that's you, I wanna invite you on the bottom of the screen to just click that, I'm making a decision today. I'm making a decision to invite Jesus Christ into my life and into my heart. All you have to do is wherever you're at, just cry out, say, Jesus, save me, forgive me. I repent, I'm tired of living for myself. I've made a mess of things, I surrender. Come into my heart, be my Lord and Savior. Cleanse me and give me a brand new heart. From this day forward, I follow Jesus. You do that and then you let us know, you confess it online. I made a decision, and you tell somebody today, today I accepted Christ into my heart. It might be prodigals who are watching, and you've been running from God for years and months, but right now there's something that's drawing you back. God's doing a new thing right now in this hour. It's stronger, it's bigger than the storm. And prodigals are right now being stirred to come home. If you're a prodigal, and in your heart you're just like, I wanna get right with God, I need to come home. You let us know, you click, make a decision that I made a decision today and let us know I am like the prodigal. I'm coming home to the Father and I'm falling at his feet and I want you to know that today God's ready to meet you and to forgive you. Today is a brand new beginning. And Lord, I pray right now for those who are sick and infirmed. If you're sick and you're watching right now, what I want you to do is just take your hand and just place it on yourself. If you're not alone, if there are others there, believers there with you, I want them to just gather around you and just through the laying on of hands, on your shoulder, just very calmly. Right now, we pray for the healing touch of Jesus, the healing virtue of Jesus. And we rebuke every sickness, every disease, right now in the name of Jesus. And we speak life and health and peace. In Jesus' name. And finally, I just wanna pray this. Pray over our whole church family. Lord, this weekend is a weekend unlike any other. 
but I believe with all of my heart that you've called your church to rise up in this hour. And so I pray over all of Radiant Church that in this unprecedented hour, we would respond with unprecedented faith and grace and mercy and hope and love to a world that is in darkness. If there's ever been a time for us to be the light, it's right now. Lord Jesus, would you cause us as Radiant Church to shine brightly. We don't just shine when we're in the same building. We shine every single day when we go to the four corners of our communities. We shine in other nations. We shine when we go to work. We shine when we care for the poor. We shine when we look for opportunities to help those who can't help themselves. Lord, would you cause us in the midst of this storm to be like you and to speak peace over somebody else's storm. I believe with all of my heart, Lord, that you're gonna have testimonies on the other side of this test. On the other side, we're gonna see a part of you that we've never seen before. On the other side of this, we're also going to see the other side of what you've put on the inside of us. Use us to be Radiant Church, we pray. Keep us, go before us, follow after us. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We want to thank all of you for joining us this weekend. Stay tuned. If you don't, follow us on all of our social media platforms at The Radiant City. Stay tuned for updates and join us Monday morning at 8 a.m. on this very portal for our 8 a.m. prayer meeting. And let's be a praying and a worshiping church together. In Jesus' name, God bless you.